Coming up on this week's show, Layla Ray is here to tell us about her new series, Trouble Brewing, and she's got a giveaway. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knauss. Welcome to episode 146 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willkanaus.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We will have more information on how you can help support the show through Patreon in just a few moments. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Another week, another show. Uh, We hope your summer is going well and that you've got the opportunity to get lots of great books read. Mm -hmm. Uh, We hope your TBR is getting smaller and that all uh, all the pages are getting flipped on those hot, sexy beach reads. Do TBRs ever really get smaller, though? I don't think they do. Mine certainly doesn't. (laughs) You knock them off the top and they come right back in the bottom. Exactly, exactly. Uh, We want to give a huge shout out and congratulations to friend of the podcast, Suzanne Brockman. Uh, The Romance Writers of America convention happened this past week in Denver, and she was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, She's been on the show uh, three times now, twice with her family. Um, It was really great to hear that she was going to win this award, and I think she really, I I suspect, lit up the convention uh, with her speech. Uh, she was uh, introduced by her son, Jason, uh, who, among other things, talked about how, uh, with his permission, she actually outed him in print in Hot Target uh, back in the day. Uh, you've heard uh, some of her story of her advocacy for uh, LGBTQ+, uh, the community, and how she fought to get gay characters into her romances. That's back in episode 102. Uh, but her speech certainly goes f- into far more detail with the battles that she uh, had to go through with both uh, her agent, uh, traditional publishing, with RWA itself. Uh, that speech really pulled no punches. Uh, and I just want to quote a little bit of it here uh, for you. Uh, she said, And when you grow up in a world where you learn, just from watching, that you are let in but others are not, you often accept that as your truth. So when you write what you see and what you know and what you have been told to believe, like books set in a town where absolutely no people of color or gay people live, you are perpetuating exclusion and the cravenness and fear that's at its ancient foundation. Yeah, I'm talking to you, white, able, straight, cis, allegedly Christian women, and don't at me with not all white women because 53% of us plunged us into our current living hell. You go, Suzanne Brockman. Tell it like it is. And, uh, can we do Suzanne Brockman for president in 2020? Because I think that'd be kind of fun. She's got some awesome perspectives. Uh, we have a link in the show notes to the full text of Jason's introduction, as well as the speech. And there's supposed to be a video coming, because I, for one, want to hear her read these words. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes and link it on our social media uh, when it comes out. Uh, what did you think of the speech? I know you gave it a read also. Fantastic. Always uh, fiery and smart. And well thought out, as Suzanne Brockman always is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, On on a lighter note, uh, we want to give a congrats to Missy, uh, who won the free registration we were giving away uh, to the 2019 Coastal Magic. Missy had several uh, fun entries that I saw on Facebook, as did uh, Jennifer, who ultimately picked the winner. Uh, And we look forward to meeting Missy in February. Teenage secret agent Theo Reese is back in action in Schooled, the second book in the Codename Winger series. Theo's high school computer science club is gearing up for a competition, and he agrees to lend his knowledge of cybersecurity to help them win. The covert agency he secretly works for also needs his talents when an encrypted key that allows access to the nation's electrical grid has been stolen. The file shows up at the competition as one of those to be decoded. Theo must find a way to be both an average high school student and TOS agent winger. The file must be secured, all while protecting his teammates from those who will use any means necessary to get the file for themselves. 
Schooled is available in ebook and paperback wherever books are sold. And if you missed Theo's first mission, pick up Tracker Hacker today. So we watched quite a bit of TV over the past week with some some good documentaries and movies. And before we drop into that, I want to take a little moment to talk about World of Dance. Uh, dance competition shows are back for the summer. And in particular, this past week, there was a group on World of Dance called Mar Inspired. This was two guys uh, doing a contemporary piece. We don't often see that on the dance competition shows. It's happened only a couple times, and so you think you could dance. But these two were extraordinary. And one of the things that really struck me about this duo was that one of the guys actually called himself the furthest thing from a dainty dancer. Uh, and that he essentially was an SUV rolling across the dance floor, which wasn't quite doing himself justice. He executed some amazing turns. This duo did such really an inspiring dance that was really the back and forth that is a relationship between the love and the occasional fights and the it was everything that you would want to see on world of dance i put a link in the show notes for the youtube and highly encourage you to just check that out for two minutes of awesomeness uh, moving on to documentaries, we did two very different ones this week. Uh, really quickly, I want to talk about two documentaries that are currently on Netflix. You can uh, uh, watch them stream any old time you feel like it. The first one is called, I'm looking at my list real quick, um, Making Fun, the story of Funko. Funko is a incredibly popular toy company and this documentary is about essentially it gives you their origin their very humble origin story uh, and then spends the rest of the documentary exploring the um, incredibly passionate fandom that has sprung up around Funko uh, and some of the events and things that the company does uh, for these fans um, it's pretty remarkable uh, if you are curious or are a Funko fan yourself, highly recommend you check out Making Fun. Also, this past week, we took a look at Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story. Uh, this is, of course, a documentary about the golden age Hollywood star Hedy Lamar. Um, and it's really about... It's sort of peeling back the layers, I think, of who Hedy actually was. I think... Um, Hetty's probably remembered, if anyone remembers her at all, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, so <laughs> I am, of course, uh, a big fan of Golden Age Hollywood movies. Uh, love them to pieces. Um, and unfortunately, I think Hetty Lamar and her uh, fame has faded over the years. Most people have no idea who Hetty was. Um, this documentary attempts to remedy that, not only kind of covering her rise to fame as a MGM contract player. It explains some of about some of her life uh, before Hollywood, uh, escaping the Nazis in Austria, and sort of her um, occasionally difficult private life. Um, but also, what it does is it shines a light on Hetty's keenly inquisitive mind. My, um, there was a. Uh, magazine article several years ago that uh, uh, essentially uncovered the fact that Hetty was an inventor, a closet inventor. After her long days uh, on the NGM lot, she would go home, she had a little room in her house, and she would invent things. She would come up with stuff. And one of the most remarkable things she did is she came up with an idea for frequency hopping. And um, her inspiration was she really wanted to do something uh, for the war. Uh, the Nazis were rolling across Europe at that time in the very early 40s. Uh, this was before uh, the U.S. became involved in World War II. Uh, and she was very, very passionate about the war effort, and she wanted to do something. She wanted to use her brains. Uh, and she got a patent for this frequency hopping idea uh, and it was essentially meant uh, for uh, guided torpedoes uh, because uh, the Nazi submarines were kicking ass uh, in the Atlantic at that time. Um, unfortunately, the Navy uh, poo-pooed her idea and said, no, no, little girl, don't you worry about it. We'll take care of this. 
and essentially she was uh, forced to use her glamour and notoriety uh, just to, essentially to sell war bonds. Now a lot of Hollywood stars at this time were very passionate about the war effort and helping out in any way they could. Um, so one of the ways they could do that was helping out at places like the Hollywood Canteen uh, and also war bond drives were a very big thing. Uh, and that's where Hetty uh, focused most of her efforts in the war years. Uh, fast forward in the documentary uh, several more years, um, that patent uh, was later uncovered and eventually used by the government. And the everyday technology that we all use literally every single day is based on Hetty's idea. All of our computers, all of the Bluetooth, all of our phones, uh, we wouldn't have it if Hetty didn't come up with this frequency hopping idea. The documentary sort of wraps up with the difficulties she had uh, later in life. Uh, unfortunately, this is not uncommon. Um, a lot of Hollywood stars from the golden era had a very difficult time once the studio system collapsed, mm -hmm. uh, and Hetty was no exception. But um, she did eventually get acknowledged for this uh, remarkable idea. And um, this documentary uh, really shines a light on um, an incredibly unique and special woman. I'm really glad that this got made, and I highly recommend everyone take a look at it. It's a pretty exceptional documentary. Yeah. I was glad you brought out both of these this week. I, I very much enjoyed Funko, really hearing their story of creating something from nothing. And mm -hmm. exactly. it's like, I want that license and going to get that and then getting <laughs> this license and that license. And now there's like a zillion uh, vinyl pop figures out in the world. Uh, and I so badly want to go to their store in Washington. That looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, and Bombshell, I mean, I've, I know who Hedy Lamar is. You've showed me some of her films. But to hear all this other part of her life, yeah. and notable too for Bombshell, it's also Robert Osborne's last film appearance before he passed away, the longtime host of Turner Classic Movies. So it was good to see that last bit of him as well. Mm -hmm. Now, over in, in the books, you've continued your Lavender Stores uh, staycation. Yes, I have. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have spent another week in the lovely Lavender Shores. Uh, I want to talk about The Veranda. It is book three in this series. Uh, and in this particular story, our heroes are Donovan. He is a therapist who we met uh, in book two. Uh, he's Gilbert's longtime therapist. And uh, our other hero is Spencer. He is a lawyer. And he came to Lavender Shores uh, several years ago, kind of looking to find himself. Uh, and he ended up marrying Donovan's half-sister. Fast forward uh, several years. Uh, Spencer uh, is now a divorced uh, guy trying to find his way. Uh, and the story picks up at a costume party uh, during Pride Week in San Francisco. Donovan and Spencer see each other at this party, uh, and they're both in costume. Uh, they're both wearing masks, uh, and they hook up on this one night. They both see each other and actually recognize one another. They're not particularly good costumes. And um, <laughs> uh, they, they see their chance, finally, after all these years, uh, and they grab it, uh, and they hook up this one night. Uh, then, of course, they have to go live their lives back in Lavender Shores. And there's a brief portion of the book that's sort of where our two characters spend some time going, ooh, I wonder if he knows it was me, ooh, and all this sort of thing. Uh, we get through that very, very quickly. Uh, and they come to realize that they want to, uh, finally, after all these years, uh, explore uh, this relationship with one another. Um, what's nice about this book is is that they get the I love you love yous out of the way relatively quickly uh, because they have been uh, longing for one another for so very long. Uh, so they get that out of the way, uh, have lots of really wonderful sex. <laughs> um, as in all of the lavender. I was going to say there's a theme in lavender shores with really wonderful sex. A little bit. Um, so uh, and what's 
actually a little bit unique and different about this book is that both of our main characters are a little bit older. Both of them are professional and they both um, tackle the problems that are facing them um, with a very, how do I want to put this without, I don't want to make it sound boring, but they act like adults and they sit down and they talk stuff through. <laughs> Which is really crazy. That's a crazy <laughs> idea in a romance novel. Um, <laughs> um, because they've got a lot of stuff to work through. Like I said, they say I love you relatively early in the book. Uh, so they're, they've essentially made this commitment to one another. The problem is, is that there are other people, other circumstances surrounding them. Uh, some of which are um, the complicated family dynamics. Spencer was, of course, married to Donovan's half-sister. Uh, so there's her that we need to deal with. Um, there are some unsupportive family members that they have to kind of come out to and uh, work through those family dynamics. Um, both of their parents are frankly assholes. Um, <laughs> So uh, they have to get through that. And plus, there are Spencer's kids, uh, two wonderful children. Um, he loves them to pieces. And Donovan is a devoted uncle. Um, and it's uh, they have to be careful because this relationship is so new. They want to make sure that they're doing the right things for the kids and finding the right time and the right way to tell them. Um, also something that I thought was really nice about this book is that for Spencer, this is essentially his very first relationship with a guy. So that's a lot of, a, when I talk about they, they sit down and talk things through, that's what a lot of the book is. It's, um, being, exploring the relationship and, uh, and coming out um, and sort of taking baby steps and not going too fast. Um, really quickly, I want to mention that the book is uh, named after The Veranda, which is uh, essentially Donovan's front porch. Since everything, <laughs> since everything in Lavender Shores is a little more upscale and la-di-da, one of the running jokes through the book is that people often refer to this area in front of his house as the veranda. And there are several key scenes in the book that take place in front of Donovan's house. So it's uh, important to our two main characters. Really quickly, um, Spencer also has a fondness for the works of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, there are some uh, funny jokes that happen throughout the book. Uh, and the finale takes place, actually, at a rather comedic... Uh, dinner theater production of Cats. Um, so there's lots of wonderful sex, a lot of genuine emotion, uh, and a lot of heartfelt comedy in this particular book. And not too surprisingly, I highly recommend book three, The Veranda, uh, Leverage Your Horse series. Check awesome. it out. Yeah, you, you, you read me a little bit of the Cats part, and that was a hoot, um, even though I hadn't read the rest of the book. So... I enjoyed that. Now, you, I know, have become a big fan of Layla Rainey, uh, and you have recently read her newest book. Yes. I got to read Imperial Stout uh, ahead of its release, which is this week. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first in the Trouble Brewing series. Uh, and here we get to find uh, two characters from Agent Irish and Whiskey spun off into their own book. We've got kidnap and rescue expert Cameron Barn or Burn rather. Uh, he turns up. He's a friend of Jamie's that we met in book two of uh, Irish and Whiskey. And we've also got U.S. Attorney Dominic Price, who cropped up uh, early on in the series because he was messing around with Aiden in book one before he and Jamie got together. Uh, so these two are now at the heart of the Trouble Brewing series. And this is all in San Francisco, as the Irish and Whiskey books are. And in this case, uh, Cam and Nick are working to take down uh, a, a plot to take to steal artifacts from a museum. Uh, and they have to get to the heart of the crew and get, get the crew and put everything back to normal, except there's a bit of an inside job potentially happening here. And their first attempt to uh, take care of this goes horribly wrong as their informant 
is captured and people die and it all of a sudden blows up into uh, something near an international incident that this all went down. Cam ends up going deep undercover as a lockpick and thief, which scares him to do because that's sitting in his past as as what he used to do before he kind of put himself back together and turned himself into the adult that he is, but he's scared about getting pulled back into that life. Uh, so Nick is really keeping track of, of how Cam's doing with all that. And at the same time, Nick has issues coming up because his father has some shady real estate dealings going on and those start blowing back on him, potentially putting those he loves in danger and the brewery that he's been building uh, as his essentially his retirement business, uh, having this uh, brewery. Uh, as with the original Irish and whiskey books, Layla does such an amazing job of building the suspense. Her very cinematic feel to the writing, and you, you see these busts go down, you see these things happen, and it just all blows up like right there. But at the same time that all the action's going on, you've got both Nick and Cam worrying for the other person as in this book their their love essentially starts to build in this book as they're now working together and being more around each other and it's kind of hilarious the places that they will choose to have a makeout moment because it's like you really shouldn't be doing that right there <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway <laughs> um of course all of your favorite characters uh including aiden and jamie uh show up here in this first book um I read out a sequence. I've only read the first two Irish and Whiskey books. So there are parts of that story that I have not read yet. Uh, it did not it did not bother me that I was getting, obviously, spoilers from mm -hmm. the later Irish and Whiskey books. Mm -hmm. As I was reading this, it was more of like, oh, I'm so glad that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I will surely go back and finish those <laughs> later. Your mileage on this may vary, so mm -hmm. just be aware that there are some things you know that will spoil out if you haven't finished. But overall, I love this book, and uh, we'll actually be talking to Layla about it here in just a few minutes. Now, if you're interested in any of the movies or books that we have just mentioned, all you have to do is go to the show notes page, and you'll find links for everything that we've been talking about. Also, on the show notes page, you can learn... Well, actually, you'll find the link for uh, our Patreon page. On that page, you can find everything you need to know about how you can help support this show. Um, there are different monetary... I had to think for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are, are there different levels of sponsorship, uh, different monetary commitments, Um for as little as like 25 cents an episode, you can help support this show. Um, whether you pledge big or pledge small, uh, it's something we are truly grateful for because those pledges help pay for the cost of keeping this show running. There are a lot of small but... A routine. Lot, yes, thank you. <laughs> a lot of routine things that need to be done behind the scenes. Uh, technical technical stuff that I don't know much about, but um, that's why you have me. <laughs> that's why Jeff's here. <laughs> um, uh, he keeps things running smoothly, and your patronage dollars help keep the show going. So, if you would like more information on how you can help support the show, all you have to do is go to Patreon.com/slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. As always, that is P A T R E O N dot com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. As you mentioned, going into my review of Imperial Stout. Uh, I have fallen so hard for Layla Rainey uh, in the past few months. I didn't know I was missing uh, this aspect of my life of romantic suspense. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. Uh, so it was great to get to talk to her to find out about Imperial Stout and where that's going and what else she's up to in her writing. I'm super excited to welcome Layla Rainey to the podcast. 
Lila weaves her bi-coastal experiences into her stories, along with adrenaline-fueled suspense and heart-pounding romance. When she's not writing, she downloads too many books, watches too much television, and cooks too much food with her scientist husband. Her new book, Imperial Stout, which is a spinoff from the Agents Irish and Whiskey series, arrives the day this podcast drops on July 23rd. Welcome, Layla. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is super exciting to have you on. I became hardcore into Irish and Whiskey uh, <laughs> when well, I started yeah. reading those. Uh, your adrenaline-fueled suspense tagline works a hundred percent right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, yeah, I try to keep that up across no matter what, and uh, it keeps me writing exciting stuff too. So I like it. It's it's what I like to read and and watch and and write. So. Nice. Well, and before we get into Imperial Stout, for sure. folks who may not know, let let's talk a little bit about Irish and whiskey. Yeah. What, tell what is that series about? So, um, Agents Irish and Whiskey, uh, Aiden Talley is a uh, FBI agent who lost his husband and his partner in a uh, accident eight months ago, and he is assigned a new partner who is cyber agent Jamie Walker, uh, Jameson Walker, which nicknamed Whiskey, obviously. He's also a former basketball player, and um, he is a cyber agent, and, you know, at first Aiden thinks he's getting demoted in a way to to play with cyber but turns out Jamie's kind of the key to figuring out what happened to his husband um and that death and so um yeah there are mysteries in each of the three books um and then there's an overarch as well the first book they are investigating some suspicious activity at a bsl4 lab so all the the outbreak stuff um down in galveston and um then the second book, they're on an undercover gig back in North Carolina where Jamie um, played basketball. So I'm a Tar Heel. So that gets uh, woven in a fair bit. So word of <laughs> heads up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you, you've got the, that San Francisco, North Carolina thing comes right out between the books being primarily set in San Francisco and then Jamie being uh, North Carolina. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a little of, of me. You know, we've, uh, born and raised in North Carolina and then moved out here in uh, about 14 years ago. So, um, to San Francisco. So, uh, you get a little flavor of both. So, what was your kind of inspiration behind starting the series? Sure. Um, you know, part of it is living out here in Silicon Valley. The tech is is all around, and we have friends that work in security and cybersecurity. And, my husband builds computers um, when he's not doing the science thing. And so, you know, it's kind of your worst case scenarios, everything that could possibly go wrong. And we actually knew someone who worked in a BSL-4 lab, too. So, um, you know, putting all that together. And then I watched a ton of action movies and cop shows growing up. X-Files was my, was my thing. So I always loved the FBI agents and just kind of found a way to put it all together. And then, you know, the cabinet's full of scotch and whiskey, too. <laughs> but I remember looking at the cabinets going, hmm, what am I going to name things? <laughs> so. Well, I was going to ask about the names because, yeah. I mean, each of the individual books has, like, Imperial Stout is is certainly liquor-based and cask sure. strength and on and on. So you've referenced looking at the cabinet. Is that how these books get their names, essentially, is what makes sense from the from the liquor shelf um to some extent and the story you know for irish and whiskey it was the character names that came first um i knew the one character was going to be irish so aiden tally tally i think i pulled out of a contact list but um i wanted him to be irish and um then jameson walk you know i think i had actually what worked best with tally for a tally walker kind of sound and i was like oh Jameis, because what would a Southerner do? We would do something like that. Um, and then it was kind of, what do we get down to as far as titles? You know, we have, I think, almost all the Ardbeg. So it was like, I could name one Supernova. I could name one Weedagal, but I don't think anyone wants to hear that. So, um, or figure out how to pronounce it. And so single malt worked and it worked particularly well for the plot. Um, of this guy who was newly single and very concentrated in his anger and trying to figure out what was going on. Cast strength, you know, it, it just getting even 
their relationship blending in the cask and then barrel proof to the point that it was finished. Mm. And so it actually worked all the way. And then Imperial Stout, they work even better, <laughs> in my opinion, because um, with Imperial, it's it's kind of Cam is a very stoutish character, so to speak, um, in his upbringing, even in his appearance, in his you know stick by itness of things. In the second book, um, Craft Brew, it's it's a kidnap case, it's the cold case, and it's kind of Cam at his best. And then Noble Hops is the story of. Nick's family and how he is noble. And so it actually worked out really well for titles. I love doing titles, so it's it's always fun. And Tequila Sunrise, because Mel can't stand all the whiskey. She's like, give me a tequila, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like how you took the branch uh, off and gave Mel and Danny their own story. And for folks who don't know, Mel and Danny show up in, in book one of Irish and Whiskey and kind of have their nice own side storyline going out through that series too. Yeah, I wanted to show that. Um, yeah, you know, they kind of got on the page together. I wasn't expecting that. And then I wrote that scene in Single Malt where they show up in Galveston and the snark just flew. I was like, well, okay, they're together. <laughs> they're gonna something's gonna happen there. Um, and it just worked out because Mel kind of needs some love too. So. And it sounds like the the new series will be a trilogy as the original. Yes. Irish and whiskey. Yeah. So there's an overarching um, plot thread with what's going on with Nick's father um, and his family. And so that's kind of the overarching mystery. And then we've got the cases, uh, book one, book two, and then three is dealing with that overarching thread. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I guess we should, we should dive in and talk a little bit about Imperial Stout because you're bringing Cam and Nick together from sure. who've appeared in the other books what's your general kind of thing that's going to be going on here? We've hinted at this family mystery. Yeah. So there's the family mystery going on. There's, you know, it's a different story and a different kind of setup a little bit from Irish and whiskey because these two guys know each other. They like each other. It's more along the friends to lovers, coworkers to lovers uh, trope line. And they're older too. Um, Cam's 35, Nick's 45. So it's, it's different in that it's not so much, I mean, it is about them getting together in the romance, but it's also about them dealing with their relationship with all the things around them. Um, Cam's family, Cam having to work through his past, and then Nick having to work through his and his family. So um, that's more, that's kind of the differentiating factors and, and how this is different and that drives the stories, you know, in this first one, both characters, um, it's a heist case. Cam has to go undercover. He has to scratch the surface of his old life, um, which was not necessarily by the law. Um, and Nick is starting to deal with the blowback from some bad decisions his father made. And so, you know, they're starting to, they're already attracted to each other. They're, you know, they want to start a relationship, but they've got these other things that are, that are going on and trying to deal with their friends about like, hey, let's not tell everybody quite yet. Um, and then you get to book two and Cam's family and dealing with the cold case that kind of made him what he is to an extent in the FBI and kidnap and rescue. And like I said, book three is Nick dealing with all of his stuff and them getting, getting there happily ever after. Nice, because of course the HEA has to be there. Yes, yeah, and these, you know, for anyone who is a little freaked out by Irish whiskey, these have a little firmer happy for now endings. Um, I did not pull an end of cast strength on you this time, so <laughs> <laughs> I went a little more gentle. <laughs> so, but that's kind of what I was telling you before we started recording that yeah. it's rare for me to kind of start a series these days and then immediately go to the next book. And he just yanked me right through from one to two. And I even felt bad that I'm like, I had to take a pause at the end of two to go listen to some other stuff yeah. before I came back. And it, you just, you pull people. Yes, two has the cliff. Yeah. But even one was a gentle, like, come this way. <laughs> yeah. I love my, I love my tags. That last scene that's, you know, I, I grew up more television than books. And so, and started writing with fan fiction 
and also writing screenplay uh, for student television in college. And so my brain thinks of everything as a television show. Mm -hmm. The way the acts progress, the way it's written, the story turns, and there's a tag at the end. <laughs> you know, there's your tag scene at the front and your tag at the end. And so that kind of plays into it. It's just a matter of, and, and these all have their tags. Um, in Imperial, there's there's Cam looking into something, um, and then at the end of the craft, there's one of my favorite scenes I've written between two characters. It's kind of, it's it was an interesting scene. I did not know that was going to be the last scene, and then when I wrote it, it was kind of like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I really loved that. So nice. Yeah. What before we, we we lose track of it what were your your the fan fiction you liked to write what were your who were your couples um so x-files uh Mulder scully i also read slash fic um so was reading some of the Mulder crycheck stuff and then um i went to law school which killed all creativity for about you know 10 years with <laughs> that in practice and then got back into it with just kind of the general cw landscape vampire diaries arrow and it was interesting because the whole time I didn't realize I was writing romance and that's what I was writing. Right. Um, and I was writing romantic suspense, particularly on the X-Files stuff. Um, and then even more so with, with some of the vampire diary stuff with P and R elements, but, and then it was kind of like, Oh, I'm writing this. I didn't realize this is what I was writing. And so it was, it was a pretty natural progression then into, into romantic suspense from there. Mm -hmm. so. What what turned the corner for you to decide to move from the the fan and slash into your own characters and and getting published? Um, part of it was time. Um, some things happened in my personal life that opened up more. I you know went solo. All of a sudden, had a lot more time on my hands that I could pursue those things that I wanted to do. Um, and then also, I love fan fiction. It's great, but you do get with kind of constrained within the bounds of the universe the readers know. Even when you're writing alternate universe outside of, you know, Damon and Elena aren't vampires, they're humans in a law firm, whatever. But you're still confined to what the readers perceive as what they would do. You're still trying to stay in character and certain places that might be familiar, like the same house. So, you know, wanting to basically branch out, you know, have different characters, have their own dialogue, have... Um, everything set in San Francisco or North Carolina. <laughs> um, and so I think that's kind of, it, it was largely a circumstance that made it possible. But from a creative standpoint, yeah, I just wanted to play with my own, my own characters. So. That's very cool. Yeah. I love hearing the stories on how this turns. Cause of course there is a lot of, of romance writers who started in, in fanfic. Well, it's such a great platform, right? You you get to hone your voice, you get to learn writing, you get to learn how to take feedback, you get to learn how to take reviews. Um, it's wonderful um, for prepping you. And then, um, but you don't have to necessarily do it all. The characters are there, so you can work, you know, the setting may be there, so you can work more on your voice um, and kind of developing those things so that when you are ready to do it with your own characters, there's some basis there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great jumping off point. You mentioned you were an attorney and you had all the law school. I imagine yeah. that helps a lot as you're researching all of these things that you have going on with the FBI. And the, there are several attorneys, of course, that crop up yeah. through here because Nick's a federal prosecutor and, right. and, and such. Um, I'm tr I do transactional corporate. So it's not, I mean, I, you know, took the classes in law school, but what's great is that I have contacts. So it's like, I need to talk to an AUSA about what happens, pick up the phone. Um, now, of course, everything's exaggerated because this is fiction. Of course. Uh, like, does it pass the James Bond test and let's go on? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's that. But yeah, there's, it's nice having a background in it. Um, somewhat, you know, seeing the inside of a grand jury room, that kind of thing. So... But yeah. And you mentioned you had somebody who, who also worked at the lab. Yeah. Uh, but for like the cyber side of things, I guess you know those people too to at least vet the, the concept works. Yeah, I know more of those people than I probably do of anything else. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I, I had a good friend who was who was reading through actually on the beta uh, about Jamie, what he was doing or not, and that was always my question: Does it pass the James Bond test? Okay, <laughs> um, and so uh, yeah, it was good to vet all that too. And of course, there's always that: how much do I give the reader so it's not too technical babble at the same time? Yeah, yeah, and it's. I tried to do that of pulling it back down. I'm sure there's still some that that's that's babbling. Um, what was more interesting was probably writing Nick and my. It was hard not to go in the legalese. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> yank it back a little bit. Um, even though I don't practice that, you know, knowing what the words are and and whatnot. So, um, but it's always a balance, and that's what editors are for too. So my editors, we've worked together now for seven books, um, eight. And so you know, we're pretty good at, at parsing that out and getting it where we need to be. Mm -hmm. What's your general process? Are you, are you, are you a plotter, pantser, fall somewhere in the middle? Oh, I'm a plotter. I, I'm, I'm a type A plotter. So um, everything is pretty, I write my synopsis in advance. So we've got the, the basis of kind of what's going on and um, do cards. I use Scrivener, so I have the cards in Scrivener of what's going on. Um, I follow a, it's kind of, it's the W chart of what's going on and the midpoint and down and up and have all those beats planned out. And then I write a dialogue layer first. Again, coming from screenplay, that's what comes to me first is a character talking and they're talking. It also ensures that dialogue drives ever seen. So no one's in their head too much. Um, so I'll do a dialogue layer first, and then I will go back through and add in the blocking, add in the emotions, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then once that layer's done, I edit from the back forward. Hmm. So last scene, first scene, making sure all the uh, threads are tied together. And um, then it goes to publisher, and then we go through the whole edit rounds. So... Yeah, and the fun really begins. <laughs> yeah, which, God bless Scrivener, because it makes life so much easier of moving scenes around and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I, I, I live and die by Scrivener as well, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the inspiration for the new series? Did you always have in mind that, that Irish and Whiskey would spin off? Um. Well, like I said, I knew when um, Mel and Danny came on the page that they were going to they needed a story um, together. Cam shows up in book one briefly, and so in Single Malt, and I was like, I kind of like him. He, I, he might need a book. Um, and then I got to two, and he shows up a lot more in cast strength. I was like, okay, yeah, he definitely needs a book. And then I put him and Nick on the page together in three, and it was sparks. I was like, they argue, they're great. Um, I didn't know Nick was, I mean, Nick started out as a foil, as a romantic foil for Aiden and Jamie. Um, but then he kind of, with him, it's really appealing back the layers kind of thing. You kind of don't know what all is under there, including this badass seal. Um, and so, you know, once they got on the page together, it was like, okay, yes. And kind of the trilogy idea worked the first time I wanted to do that again. I like that having multiple books to develop the relationship and, um, and the plot points. Mm -hmm. And so, and then there's also a brewery we go to every Friday night with food trucks. So, <laughs> um, it's like, Oh yeah, he can have some, he can have a side side gig too. I kind of like that. It's very alternate side gig from being, yeah, you know, the the federal prosecutor to I'm gonna go work at my brewery now. <laughs> and that's a little me. It's an old like here's the writing thing, here's the law thing, and I think so many people have side gigs that it, it's it's not unrealistic that someone might have a day job and a, and a different job. You kind of need the two outlets uh, for sanity purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was a nice little side gig, or or you know, and headed towards you know something for the future, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Do you think people need to read Irish and Whiskey and its completion before they pick up this new one? You know, I kind of relate it to uh, the TV shows Buffy and Angel. You know, if you watched, you could have 
watched Angel without watching Buffy. Do you have a fuller picture of everything? Yes. Do you know who these side characters are that show up on occasion for special episodes? Yes. Um, so that's kind of what I'd say. You can definitely pick it up having not read Irish and Whiskey. If you want the full effect of it, then, you know, go grab those books too. Yeah. And I would even say you could take it if you have in the middle of Irish and Whiskey because that's exactly how I've been approaching yeah. it. And yeah. it's like... You get, you get some hints on what happens in Irish and Whiskey, but it's not like, ah, oh, damn, I wish I'd read that other book first. <laughs> yeah. No, um, they're there because they, they all work together, right? So, because Aiden and Cam work together at the FBI, Jamie and Aiden are married, and so, like, everyone's kind of, they're all in the same orbit. And one of the big, kind of the underlying themes of, I think, both series, kind of the Whiskey vs. Universe, but particularly um, the Trouble Brewing series, is family, like finding your family. Because Nick never really had one, and that's that's kind of his journey, is going from no family to a ton of family. And, and Cam also making amends with his and having bi-coastal families. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of, you know, you get the full picture of it then. One of the things I like, speaking of family, especially in, in Irish and Whiskey, is how great Aiden's family is. Yeah. They're that's... such a big, awesome, what do we need to do to help you get this done kind of family. Yeah, big Irish family, right? Um, I was an only child, but we have a big family like that, um, growing a big Southern Irish family. And so that's how it, how it is, right? And so... Um, that's kind of what that draws from. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned earlier X Files as like being yeah. a driver for the the suspense side of of things. Sure. Uh, what else kind of it, it fuels your your mind around suspense plot lines? Um. So let's see. Like I said, the fan fiction, that background, a lot of movies, right? Um, to like Man from Uncle, I adore. Oh, um, nice one. <laughs> I can watch it over and over and over. Um, so, and then I just, I like, you know, John Wick too, thinking about it, um, particularly the way Imperial Stout just drops into action. Like I thought the opening scenes to John Wick too is quite possibly one of my top 10 favorites. I love how that movie just drops you right in the middle of a car chase. Like could not make me happier. Um, so that's kind of what fueled that structure. Um, And then, um, you know, I really like that you have the external from a, from a writing standpoint, I like that you have the external pushing along the internal and you have them working so well, um, together that no one's in their head too much. There's still lots of plot. I like them balanced. Um, and it's so funny because in the TV shows, I'm always, I'm always the one going, are they going to get together? Are they going to get together? Even though it's not really a romance movie. (laughs) Um, like castle killed me, um, for years. Uh, but so I really like to see that of, of the external kind of pushing, um, the internal, be it the relationship or the characters grow. So that's why I, I really enjoy writing romantic suspense. That was cool. And what, what sent you down the MM route Yeah. for the romantic suspense? Um, I had read it some, like I said, in slash check, um, Mulder Krychak, Delaric in the, the TVD route. Um, and then, you know, I started writing with male, female, be it fan fiction. And then the first manuscript I wrote was, um, along the same time, you know, you're supposed to read what you're writing. And so I would had really started digging into, um, romantic suspense books. And there was this great list on heroes and heartbreakers of here's the 10 romantic suspense books you should read about halfway down. That list was cut and run. Uh, I was kind of shot at that point. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm good. This is what we want to do. Um, I'd also read the Lord John side series in out from outlander mm-hmm. um, and loved him. I loved how tight the mysteries were. Um, and so I kind of, you know, when single malt started forming agent Sarge whiskey in the head, that's just where it went um, as to, as to being two male characters. So cool. And I love that you list cut and run. We, we get cut and run a lot is like somebody's yeah. initial, either their initial read or the inspiration to kind of, 
you yeah, know, I mean, moving in that direction. I like I'd read the Lord John stuff. I was like, oh, this is good. I think I'd also asked a friend for some recommendations. I probably read him as well. Um, and then I hit that hit cut and run. I did not go back to the list because <laughs> nine books later, <laughs> I'm in Thai and Zane land and it's lovely. Um, and then just kind of went from there. Yeah. And I love that you list him. That's one of my all time favorites too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So what other authors inspire you and in what you do? Yeah. So I really like, you know, a variety of things. I love authors who I can get lost in their whole universe, right? Um, Kristen Ashley, all of her books, like the Colorado set, it's like, oh, here's the Nightingales are showing up over here. Um, so I love those big universes. That's kind of what I, you know, what I'm doing here in building out a universe. Sloan Kennedy's Protector series as well. Um, so I love that aspect. I really like books that I can see in my head as a TV show, obviously, um, that are really visual. Um, C.S. Picat's Captive Prince trilogy, that was one of my first reads, too, and, you know, uh, um, <laughs> yep. uh, Nora Sakovich is all for the game uh, series as well, Tal Bauer's Executive Office series, anything Helen K. Diamond writes, I can just see it playing on a film reel, basically, um, and those are so exciting, and I love them. And then also authors who challenge me, um, be it incredible writing, something new to me, um, or just sheer mastery, like Alexis Hall's prose in anything mm -hmm. they write is just fantastic. Um, Anna Zabo, I think, is also pushing pushing the bounds a lot. The aromantic lead in their uh, syncopation book, you know, I thought was just brilliantly done. Um, and then Cordelia Kingsbridge, Seven of Spades series, it's just it's masterful. Like the the sheer detail, the planning, some of the scenes, the visuals are are fantastic. So those are the kind of things that that really hook me in. Nice. Yeah. That's a good reading list for somebody too. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> we should give a hat tip to your your audiobook narrator too before we get too far away from these books. Uh, Tristan yeah. James has he's very enjoyable in the I've heard the first two. Okay. Irish and whiskeys, and I'm looking forward. I may have to go back and re like listen to Imperial Stout when that comes out. Yeah, there's there's a scene too in Barrel Proof that he recorded, and he was texting. He texted me right after, and he goes, "I'm crying," right? And, and he needed to be in the scene too, so it was like, "Oh, good, that worked out." But yeah, he's great. He was a reader recommendation. Um, someone in my reader, I had solicited my reader group. You know who. Who might, you know, who do you think would do this well? I had a list to go from, but I also wanted to see if there were others out there. Um, and he was recommended, um, and it's been such a great fit. He can do all the accents, and it's just going to get worse with the lots of Boston coming in, in, in Trouble Brewing book two. Sorry, Tristan. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's been a great experience working with him. And what's coming up next for you? You've talked, there's two other of these new books coming out. Um, yeah. Do they have dates? Yeah, so um, Craft Brew, which is book two, is out uh, in ebook and audio on October 8th. And then the last one, Noble Hops, is slated for February. I don't have an exact date yet. Nice, uh, coming, coming fast and furious there. Yeah, yeah, we like to keep them close, particularly because they are a continuation and um, they're not full HEA until the end, so we don't want to keep you hanging too long. It was funny. I remember after Cast Drink that Anna Zabo had texted an email going, oh, my God, I'm dying. Can I have it now? <laughs> um, so that was really funny. And, you know, so we're trying to move them fast. Um, and then I'm going to be doing, hopefully, a, a little short collection of stories in Changing Lanes, which is the, um, the Olympic Swimmers two books that I'd put out earlier this year. So that'll come around Christmas time. Um, a little collection of past, present, and future. And um, then from there, you know, I, I turned in, the day we're recording this, it's not that it air, but I turned in the manuscript for Trouble Brewing 3 yesterday. So that was my last one uh, for right now. So there's, it's wide open in the field of what I'm going to do right now. Oh, is that exciting or daunting? It's exciting. I'm reading all the things. I'm taking away to the massive TBR over two years that have piled up. Um, but then exciting too. I have various different ideas. There's a 
there's some groundwork for another spinoff in whiskey verse that's laid um in trouble brewing so there's that option and kind of a long running mystery series i'm looking at doing possibly and then other various little bits there's this dying chef story that's been on my brain for years everyone hears me yammer about it might be time to finally write it and then a um shakespeare mystery that i'm kind of yeah okay so and tell us a little bit about uh, Changing Lanes for those yeah. who don't know that series. Yeah, so Changing Lanes is about is a um, contemporary romance, sports romance, uh, following the four-man U.S. Olympic medley relay team um, as they train and compete in the Olympics. So the first book is Relay, and that's Alex and Dane. It's a second chance um, enemies to lovers story. So they, they'd had a fling a long time ago. Dane's very closeted. He has um, pretty evil parents uh, <laughs> that they're very conservative and very, very image conscious. And so he's sort of pushing up against that. Um, and he's on the team with Alex, who he um, fell in love with when they were 16. And this is 10 years later. And so they're on the relay team. And then the other two members of the team, um, Sebastian Boss and Jacob, um, Boss is a second, is a veteran, his second time through, and he kind of made a mess of things the last go round. So he's trying to be very good, which Jacob is not helping. Jake's the um, rookie, 19 years old, um, way in over his head <laughs> as far as the Olympic experience with Boss, with everything. And so, and that's Medley, which is book two. And so you see, the first book is the domestic training portion that goes into Olympic swimming with um, them being at the U.S. Olympic facility and a domestic site. And then the second book, they go to an international site and then to the Olympics in Madrid. So it's fun. You get to see a bunch of different locations, too. Yes. I love the, the second one. They go to Vienna, and I studied there. And it was so much fun to kind of write some of those places into a story. That's cool. That sounds like it make a nice movie, too. All the locations and it's moving around. and fun. So. So you've got a giveaway for our listeners, which is exciting. What, what have you got? Yeah, so the cool thing about Imperial Stout um, and the whole Trouble Brewing series is that they're going to be in mass market paperback. So I will have paperback to give away along with a $25 Amazon gift card. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's yeah. exciting. I, I'll have to not enter that one myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have uh, details for our listeners on what they have to do to get that right after we wrap up the interview. Okay. Awesome. So what's the best way for everyone to keep up with you online to, to follow what, what comes next after, after, sure. you, after, we ta after you do everything we've just talked about? <laughs> Which is a lot. Um, I have a Facebook reader group, Layla's Lushes. Um, oh, that's, where... awesome. that's an awesome name. <laughs> <laughs> to work with the uh, the title. And so um, I'm pretty, that's probably the place I'm most active. Uh, and then um, newsletter, which you can get to through the website. And then Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And because I have to fan cast everything, uh, there's a Pinterest board with lots of pictures. Like Richard Armitage is Nick. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, there's some of those pretty pictures are on there. Oh, fantastic. We'll look yeah. up to all that stuff in our show notes so people can go check that out. Yeah, it's Layla Rain on all the sites, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. Fantastic. Well, Layla, thank you so much for coming by and talking to us. Thank you. And for hooking me on such a great series. I'm glad you're enjoying it, and hopefully uh, you'll continue to enjoy both uh, AIW and Trouble Brewing. Thanks again to Layla for coming and talk to us about the brand new series. I look forward to seeing where that's going to go in the coming months and years, perhaps, as she continues. Uh, a reminder that she is giving away a mass market paperback of Imperial Stout along with a $25 Amazon gift card. Uh, all you have to do to register to win is send an email to giveaway at biggayfictionpodcast.com with the word trouble in the subject line to enter. 
uh, only one entry per email address, please. And you can enter through 11.59 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday, July 29th. More details on that are on the show notes page. Fantastic. What's that email address again? Giveaway at biggayfictionpodcast.com with the word trouble in the subject line. Fantastic. So, guys, I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Coming up in episode 147, TJ Kloon and Kurt Graves are going to be here, and they're going to talk about their latest Raven song. Mm-hmm. It's a big week. Uh, <laughs> the week of Ju- uh, July 31st coming up with the release of Raven song. So, yeah, we've got TJ here to talk about the Burke and Kurt to talk a little bit about uh, the forthcoming audiobook that'll be with that. And we'll hear about their collaboration stuff. It's, gonna, it's a lot of fun. Now, I know a lot of people... Um... When uh, when you say T.J. Clune, they automatically associate him with the audiobooks that have been done by Kirk Graves. They sort well, of walk hand in hand. Particularly the, the Wolf Song. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, What's really... Well, and that's swell, but I actually associate Kurt with Lavender Shores. He's narrated the first three books in that particular mm-hmm. series. So when I read those books, I can hear Kurt in my head now. Uh, he's so damn good. He really is. <laughs> and one of the, the fun things that you'll get in this interview next week is for Kurt, Wolf Song was his first project. Uh-huh. Um, and now, like for me, I can't even think about reading Raven song until the audio comes out because I need exactly. Kurt to read it to me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's going to be a fun interview next week as we find out about the, the goings on in Green Creek and uh, also how they how their collaboration got started. Fantastic. Guys, so remember, no matter where life takes you, uh, <laughs> oh gosh, it's been one of those weeks, everyone. Okay, let me try that again. Remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book or are listening to an audiobook narrated by Kirk Graves. <laughs> okay, enough of this fandom. Okay, uh, remember, guys, uh, whatever you do, um, it has been one of those weeks. I don't even know where I'm going with this anymore. Just say your last line and then we can close this thing out. Thank you for showing up to episode 146, even though I've been... Oh, what a mess. Um, until next time, everyone, please keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 